Who is this 14-year-old boy? And what could he have possibly done at such a young age to be receiving an International Human Rights Award? His name is Craig Kielberger, and his story is a stirring example of what one person can do to fight unfairness and injustice. Over the past year, I've had the opportunity to travel through five countries in South Asia, and I've met many children who are suffering. Children who are living on the streets of some of the world's largest cities. I've met children sold as bonded laborers, working 12 to 16 hours a day in the carpet industry. These children have no vote, no voice, and no political clout. Many of them are subjected to some of the most inhumane forms of exploitation. And today, I am here to speak for these children. My friends and I have started an organization called Free the Children, a youth group mainly made up of young people between 10 and 16 years of age. And the purpose of our group is not only to free children from exploitation and abuse, but also to free children from the idea that they are powerless and that they have no role to play in today's society. Free the children, how may I help you? Craig Kielberger speaking. Using Craig's house as its headquarters, Free the Children set out with the goal of eradicating the exploitation and abuse of children throughout the world. Free the Children sent this 10,000 name petition to world leaders urging them to end unfair child labor practices. And they use every opportunity to speak out against child labor at schools, churches, service groups, anywhere people will listen. We have a couple of uh, special guests coming in today to talk to you about a new organization that they've organized. We've come to talk to you about a problem that we find very serious, and it is child labor. Factory owners just love to hire children because they don't have to pay them as much. They're easily intimidated, won't fight or talk back, and they cannot form trade unions. As their activities increased, so did their reputation. And then, just a few months after their conception, the Ontario Federation of Labour invited Craig to speak to the 2,000 delegates at its convention in Toronto. Children in dangerous glass factories, children in the sugarcane fields, children physically and verbally abused, children making the many products which we import into Canada and use every day without considering their source. Who will help the children if we don't? Thank you very much. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know that the board has just voted and will offer, will donate $5,000 to your cause. You said you needed $10,000? Ah, uh, yes, that's what we're hoping to raise for our funds. Okay, well, I think we can do better than that. Okay? We'd like to donate $1,000. Yeah, we'd like to $5,000. When the final tally was in, Craig had raised $150,000 to be used for projects that would directly help exploited working children of the developing world. Craig's trip to Asia and the media attention it got triggered a bombshell of activity. Free the Children chapters sprung up everywhere as thousands of kids were drawn into this international network of children helping children. And their impact is enormous. They send badly needed school supplies and health kits to children who are too poor to buy them. Through garage sales and car washes, they raise money for teacher salaries in schools that are otherwise too poor to hire them. And that $150,000 Craig got from the Ontario Federation of Labor helped build this rehabilitation and education center for children freed from labor in India. People will sometimes look at me and say, well, you know, you're only 13 years old. And while 13-year-olds, they don't do these type of things. As young people, we are capable of doing more than simply watching TV, playing video games, hanging around malls. You know, some of you may say, well, I can't do great things. Well, Mother Teresa once said that we could do no great things. We could only do small things with great love.
and if everyone around the world were willing to open their eyes and open their hearts, then there would be no more poverty, there would be no more injustice, and there would be no more abuse. And that is the challenge which we all must face. Through your words and through your actions, set these children free. Thank you. I guess I was influenced by gangs as, as little as uh, maybe fourth grade. I, saw, I knew that the gangs were around. And when your cousins are in gangs, when your friends are in gangs, you tend to also join the gang to feel part of something, part of a group. The first time I got involved was when the eighth graders left. It was like the, the new seventh graders were going to take over. So that was where I got my first respect. So they gave me a name and I started hitting it up and I started hitting them up and I went into assimilation pretty quick. Well, like seventh, eighth, I didn't really care about school. Like I wasn't learning nothing because all I kept thinking about was what I was going to do at lunch or, or who I was sitting with or when's the next party. Arturo knew that if he wanted to do well in school, he needed to get away from his friends. So he decided to attend a different high school, an hour and a half away from his home. I remember being there and, and being lonely and uh, not really having friends. All my real friends were uh, back in L.A. I was sitting in my English class and uh, I remember Mikkel coming in as, as one of the representatives of the Youth Engagement Program. Mikkel was a teacher at Arturo's High School who was involved with a YMCA program called Youth in Government. We recruited a bunch of students from Hawthorne High we had this first meeting when about 50 people showed up to this meeting. I went the first time and then I went the second time and I really liked it and so I kept going back and when he said it would be a good thing for college, it, was, it would look good for college and at that time I was, I was thinking about going to college and I didn't know where to start. I remember he, uh, we had this long talk and he was like, you know, I want to go to college. He said, what would it take to get to college? And we sat down and we wrote out, uh, I said, here, and I showed him all the classes he'd have to take, AP, honors, all this. And I think he was really kind of taken by that. After a while, when I started doing good in school and, and I started moving up to the higher classes, uh, I started getting a, a new group of friends who were, uh, they were different from the gang members. And at first, it was hard for me to relate, relate to them. They were interested in, in joining Key Club or, or joining uh, Academic Decathlon. That was their passion. While I was interested in being part of a gang and gaining turf, I think the turning point was the spring conference. We just started talking and we started thinking like, you know, hey Arturo, you, do you want to run for an office? And suddenly, like we had never thought Arturo would run for an office because he was this quiet sophomore that didn't like this. But then when he spoke, everyone would listen because here was this kid that was trying to say something. My rights as well as your rights as citizens are being ignored when this government rejects 350,000 children from the public school system just in my home state. Arturo ran for Secretary of State and won. Then, during his junior year, he campaigned to become youth governor. He spent three or four afternoons a week working with Mikkel. And the more time he spent with Mikkel, the less time he spent with the gang. The intention was never really to split from the gang. It was more I was going to get an education, but still remain in the gang. But um, after a while, I decided that I couldn't do both. I couldn't go to school and I couldn't be part of a gang and, and still be successful. If you don't do what they want you to do, then your friend will kill you. Remember going into the neighborhood, we call it the eight ball. I knew that coming back, I was going to run into trouble with people who felt I was being disloyal to the gang. One thing led to another, and uh, I was fighting my own, my own gang members, kids who I thought were, were, were my friends who uh, I thought would always defend me somehow would let something this little come between us. He told me, you know, Shady came out and he broke up the fight, and brought him in the room, and there's Arturo and his report card, and he says, I want out. And he's like, and he says, I want to go to school, I want to go to college, I, uh, 
I want to run for youth governor. I want to make a difference in my community, and I don't want to be killed. I went and I talked to Shady, and I had to show him my report card, and he looked at me and uh, he said, that's very good. Because I remember him looking at me and, and smiling, looking at the report card, and then looking back and forth at me and at the report card. And uh, he said, uh, you go back to school. He said, uh, don't worry about anything. You just worry about doing good in school. And, and so we, we came to the agreement where I, had, I did not have to worry about claiming my neighborhood in, in Hawthorne High. I did not have to worry about other gang members uh, trying to track me down or trying to get me back into the gang. That's how I finally got out. Arturo, Arturo, why don't you record yourself? You're like the real cool guy here. These are uh, new friends. They're people that I have really come to love for a different thing. Hi, you did such a good job on your proposal. These are kids that I can look at and I know that, that they're my friends because of who I am and not what I do for them. It's a different kind of friendship. It's a different kind of loyalty. Honestly, he's my hero. He sets an example for other people, and he kind of raises the bar a little bit. In spring of his senior year, Arturo's courageous journey reached a milestone when his college acceptance arrived in the mail. I remember Mikkel calling me at work and telling me that I had gotten accepted, and uh, I couldn't believe it. And, uh, I told him the same, I, I will not believe it till I'm actually sitting in class and actually listening to the profes professor lecture, then I'll believe it. Think about this. Suppose you were born into a very poor family in a neighborhood filled with crime. Suppose you grew up without your father, and some of the people closest to you were alcoholics and drug users. Suppose you had to get a job at age 13 so your family could afford to buy food. Suppose you had friends who were in jail, friends who had died, and lots of friends who had dropped out of school. What kind of future would you expect to have? Well, if you were Latifah Simon, you'd be preparing yourself for medical school. But then, this is Latifah's story. There was a dean at my high school, and she was in charge of the black students. And I was going through a lot of stuff. Um, we had got evicted from our house, and we had to move. And it was, it was hard, you know, like all of that stuff when you still want to seem cool, but you're getting evicted, and you don't really want to tell anybody. Your gr my grades were slipping, and um, my dean, she said, Ms. Scott, I'll never forget, she said, you know, if you don't take this opportunity now, you have a free education. If you don't take the opportunity, if you don't, I, I didn't want to take my SATs. If you don't take your SATs, if you don't sit down and go through this college application, it'll be over for you. <laughs> and I started to cry and I was like, well, no, it's not. And I can do this and I can do that. And, you know, I want to do radio. <laughs> and she sort of broke it down to me like, you know what? You have options and you have to make them happen for yourself. If I hadn't listened to my counselor and started taking responsibility for my own future, I wouldn't be in college right now. And since I want to be a doctor, this is where I need to be. It's hard though, because in addition to school, I have to work full time to support myself. But that's okay. I love my job. I'm the executive director at a very special place called the Center for Young Women's Development. We hire young women right out of the jails and off the streets and train them to go back into their communities to help other young women like themselves. And they go out and they talk to other young women who are in similar positions that they've been in, homeless, living on the streets. They give them information, how do I get back in school? The young women who work here, they know that. How do I get medical care? They know that. They provide the young women on the streets with linkages to services that they would otherwise, they wouldn't know where to go. I think the most important thing about the center is what it does for the young women who work here. Some of them are present and former gang members, drug users. Some are homeless. Some have been in jail. They've all been living pretty risky lives. But when they get here, they change. 
if you're going to make responsible decisions in your life, you need to be around responsible people. And so at the center, it's our goal to develop those skills within ourselves. Young women who sit around this table learn how to slowly but surely create some really strong behavioral changes in their lives. For the first time, I think, in our lives, we think about college, we think about the future, we think about saving money, we think about changing our circle of friends. What we like to say, we invest in each other. And if you invest in each other, if you invest in a community, if you invest in a bank, you're going to get something out of it. If you invest in yourself, you'll get even more out of it. So it's that individual investment. I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to sacrifice a lot. I'm going to start thinking before I act. That's our philosophy. Um, Amina's dad. Um, we were together. We were each other's first loves. And it was, we grew up together, I think. You know, we were young teenagers, and um, we grew up together. We learned a lot of things. But in the midst of it all, throughout high school, we were, like, best friends. And we were also, like, of course, boyfriend and girlfriend. And in that state, I thought, wow, you know, this is like the movies. This is like one of those high school things where we're going to be together forever. I mean, I really thought we were going to get married. But it didn't work out that way. The decision to have a child early, it wasn't well thought out. And I know that now. Sometimes I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I have a child. And I have to worry about daycare. And I have to worry about my daughter's preschool education and my education. And I have to worry about rent. And now that I have this huge responsibility of another life, um, <laughs> wow, it's, it's a lot for someone who's just barely out of high school. I made some good decisions and some not so good ones. And my life is not easy right now with all these responsibilities. But I know if I just do what I have to do, I am going to reach my goals. Responsibility and taking control over your own life is not an easy thing to do. You have to make really hard decisions. But when you make those decisions and you see the fruits of your decisions, you're a really powerful person. I think I'm so powerful. I have, I have, I feel like inside, honestly, that my future is up to me. Do you know how good that feels? That I have the power to decide where life is gonna take me? But if you make excuses for yourself, I have a lot of cliches, but you'll have nothing but excuses. <laughs> you'll be 50 or 60 or 70 talking about how hard it was for you in high school. Who's going to listen to you then? If it's hard for you in school, make it better. You can make it better. We have so much power in us that's like locked up, but like let it out. Let it out and make positive changes in your own lives. And you'll see the results and they're really cool. <laughs> they're really cool.